What's up, sweaties? John Schnepp, and you are watching episode 86 of Collider Heroes. We're going to cover all the superhero, supervillain, and awesome news of the week. Let's get started right away. With me joined is Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, how are you, John? What's how are on? you? Well, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm very excited because, you know, I have an Enter Bay six scale Donnie Yen Ip Man figure. What what company is making this? Enter Bay. Enter not, Bay. I thought uh, it's not Hot Toys. It's not, not oh. Hot Toys. It, but Hot Toys has their Chariot Imwe figure coming out. Okay. And that's also Donnie Yen. So I'm excited totally. to set up the Donnie Yen battle on my shelf. You are going to have the guy from Rogue One fighting Ip Man. I am. And it's played by the same guy. I can't wait. Well, um, I'm not going to start collecting Hot Toys or Ibscoms or what, what's the other company? Uh, well, there's Enter Bay. Enter Bay. There's Blitzway. They're Blitzway. doing the, the six scale Ghostbusters. Okay. There's 3A. Okay. That are doing, uh, they, they do lots of like Halo and all kinds oh, of. Oh, sure. Then there's all kinds of other. There's cool. Asmus Toys that does. And Lord these are all like three to four hundred dollar figures, aren't they? Yeah. They yeah, are. I'm gonna stay skimpy. Sorry, guys. I'm I can't be doing this hot toy thing yet. Not a millionaire, or I just don't have that kind of. I buy a bunch of other stuff. Well, I just don't eat. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just saying. Like, I, I waste my money in other creative ways. So it's like, uh, eventually, all of us will have hot toys, and then the world will blow up. Guess what? We're gonna we're, we've got a trickle in crew, so some crews trickling in. But we're starting the show right now by talking about Guardians of the Galaxy. That's right, the teaser trailer dropped, and not only is this the second most watched teaser trailer of all time, but it's also totally awesome. This is the way teasers should be made: show just a very little bit of the film, let the audience get the vibe. In this case, jaw dropping action and the Guardians back and forth dialogue we've come to love and expect let's talk about star lord gamora rocket drax baby groot and now mantis rob what were your thoughts when you saw this, this well, teaser uh, you know I, I it does what a great teaser does i know no i have no idea what the story is uh i'm totally intrigued i can't wait to see more and there's really two big pieces of this trailer one is rocket talking to baby groot and the other is there's a three-way conversation with the characters at the end of the trailer, actually a four-way conversation right. with a new character, with what Man Mantis, Mantis yeah. who's great. She looks great. Totally. But it, it was just character fun. I, I mean, you didn't you didn't have to see lots of loud explosions or histrionics. It was just a character beat, and once again, Drax. Oh, totally. I mean. You know, Batista is just killing it. Uh, if anybody so ever good. questioned his comic timing or if he was like feeling a little weird about not having all that, like, you know, top notch exposure as a TV star or a movie beforehand, this movie, these two movies are just cementing him as like a lovable giant alien lug who's just, just downright funny. I mean, he's really funny. Yeah. I mean, that's a laugh out loud scene. I literally, uh, I've probably watched that trailer or that this teaser, whatever you want to call it, like eight times at every time. I laughed out loud when Drax delivered his lines. I, how about how he jumps down the maw of a creature and apparently he's cutting it from the inside? I mean, that looked great too. Right. And you know what's great too is that artwork was released, I guess, maybe like five, seven months ago of that creature. And we were right. like, what is this? You know, obviously some monster. And it's like, well, it's probably not going to, you know, ring true to like highlights of the plot. It might just be some kind of a, you know, some test or who knows this training module here you must defeat the glorkin or whatever the hell it's called right but you know what i mean it's great to see this t the, the very first teaser we saw and now this one and i still don't know what the movie's about i have no idea and i think that's great i mean yeah. you know it's like the some of the great trailers of all time like the alien trailer the oh, first yeah. alien trailer and they emulated it for aliens yes you didn't know what was going on all you knew is that it looked really scary and there was an alien in it. Yeah, and they did the same, they almost used the same exact uh, tempo and sonic uses for Prometheus. Right. The, uh, ah, with the screaming, the wah, wah, wah. So it, it was great. And, it and totally I, I, worked. I love that, um, that method because it truly is a teaser. It draws you in, it does what great marketing does, which is make you want to see this movie. I mean, yes, we're, we're getting our characters back. Totally. But we haven't seen there's so many people that were not even in that trailer and that's what's great yeah we didn't we, yeah where's yon, where, where's, where's yondu? yondu you know where's ego yeah. where's kurt russell we still haven't seen ego no yet. we I have think not. they're saving that i mean the movie comes out in like a little over five months we're gonna get this movie so got a lot of flavor going on uh if you haven't checked it out definitely do yourself a favor and check it out number two we got legion 
the so that trailer dropped. Uh, it's coming out, and the trailer dropped and announced that it's coming out in February. So this new bizarre X Men related series is coming to us from Fargo's Noah Hawley, and uh, it stars Dan Stevens as Professor X's son, David Holler, codenamed Legion. And uh, this trailer looks packed with mystery, hospitals, and abstract surrealism. Now, is it gonna deliver? I am particularly fond of uh, of uh, of Legion. Robert, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, the creative team coming over from Fargo. I mean, Fargo is one of the great shows of all time. I, I mean, not of all time, but of the, of the, the modern era, the last couple of years. And and season two is better than season one. Oh yeah. And the fact that they're making a show out of this character intrigues me. Like that wouldn't have been the first on my list. But I've always loved Legion, especially the Sienkiewicz version of Legion. But totally. I, I think if they take what Sienkiewicz did with the artwork and apply it to television storytelling, we're in for a treat. Now, you know, someone just joined. Amy, what's going on? We had to start the show because we, we got a, a tight schedule. But Hi. we're talking about Legion. Did you get a chance to see that trailer? That was the thing I was going to do before I snuck on stream, but you gestured at me. Dang it, I really want to oh. watch this. I'm so sorry, guys. Well, well, what did I'm you so think of Guardians of the Galaxy yeah, Guardians, trailer? We just covered Guardians. You saw that teaser, right? I saw half of it on the way here. My phone is dead. Y'all oh, have to no. warn me before you throw me on streams. I'm so excited. I've been getting like baby group tweets all weekend, and I'm, yeah. I'm really, really excited. Well, we are not going to ruin it for you, but when you, <laughs> when you see the ending, stick around, watch all of it, because there's a little bit of extra dialogue flavor that you might feel like it's over, but then it just gets really funny. Can I just like be excused for five minutes and come back? <laughs> yeah, go ahead and watch it. <laughs> yeah, why not? I'll to? be right back. All right. We want to hear your reactions. But right. for myself, the trailer for Legion, and watch Legion too. Okay. Um, it's, a, we're, it's a tight ship today, ladies and gentlemen. We got to just rock and roll. We're doing a lot of things. We just have to rock and roll. So, Legion, I watched this trailer and I was like, yo, is this set in like the late 70s or early 80s? Did you notice like using a payphone? All the clothing is like 70s, early 80s. Everything about the clothing and the, the sets and it just screams it is not now. It is not made of this time period. So for myself, I think they might be pulling a fast one in a really cool way where they're saying this is Professor X's son and it takes place in the, you know, probably the early 80s, maybe even the same time period as Age of Apocalypse. What do you think? Well, uh, look, clearly there's anachronistic stuff happening in the trailer and I was intrigued by that. But again, is this a dream? Is he in his own head? You know, how are they going to play this? I don't know. I mean, I, I think it, if it is in the past, it opens up an interesting, like you just said, if you're whatever, in terms of the continuity, are they going to match up right. with the continuity or, or, or even acknowledge that there's the X-Men movies? Right. But if so, if you're looking at a time period that's between, say, Days of Future Past and Apocalypse, I mean, that could be really, really interesting. I, I Again, I don't know. Well, remember, I mean, X2 had Legion in it. Right, Professor I X's son was a, but quite was, a villain, yeah. But he was young. Yes. So it's, uh, but then again, you're trying, if we have to start trying to make sense of the no, X-Men No, I know, X-Men continuity is, uh, is, is, is its own entirely unique, strange, individualistic, and th by that I mean each movie is its own timeline. Literally, none of them connect in any real way, shape, or form. <laughs> no. Um, other than that, some of them are really good. I mean, that's right, kind that's of the, the best part of the X Men, you know, entire universe. All however many movies there are now, um, are is that some of them are really good, and some of them suck. So it's like, but it's a mixture. It really is a mixed bag. I mean, I, for myself, X Men: Days of Future Past is still my all time favorite. How, which one is yours? Uh, you know, I think it. I think that is too. And I, I have to say, I, I really like the first X Men. Oh yeah. And I, I like it because, it. It's, look, some of the effects are dated because the budget was was limited at the mm -hmm. time. But the fact that they pulled it off, like everybody was dubious. I was very dubious as a comic fan. I'm like, and uh, you know, Brian made it, and I'm like, I don't know, dude. And and I know he didn't have the best time making the first X Men movie because well, because they kept chipping his budget. You yeah, know? they're like, was, hey, dude, how am I going to make this? Right, and and Lauren Schuler Donner was not. Uh, she was wasn't on board, but she came around. I, she did come around. X Two, X Men United, whatever it was called. I just remembered as X Two. Uh, was fantastic. Yeah, no, boy, it what, was. What a great second sequel. But I, I, look, I, I like First Class a lot. I think First Class is great. And I'm a, I still really enjoy... Somebody tweeted me the other day and said, you know, I finally caught up with Apocalypse, and mm -hmm. I'll give it four out of five. Right. And I was like, good. I, I, I There's so much in Apocalypse that I like. Dude, Age of Apocalypse is two movies. 
everything with Apocalypse in it, I could not watch again. Everything with all the other X-Men and their storylines, I loved and I want to see more of. So yep. it really is a weird, you know, and I said this before, the Magneto storyline is kind of cutting through both like of the them. Yeah, the third storyline. Yeah, the story. third Bizarro storyline, which, you know, definitely has its merits, but then kind of floats apart at the end. So, I mean, definitely if you haven't seen Age of Apocalypse within all this X-Men madness, you might want to check it out. But X2 is the one to check out because they have some Legion in there, and we don't know if it's actually going to tie in or not. It really, I mean, surprisingly, depending on where they have this set, which my my feeling about it is it's going to be like, it, it almost could be like late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. Watch the trailer and tell me if I'm wrong. See if anybody's on a cell phone or using any kind of like crazy tech that just didn't exist back then. Or it could all be part of some elaborate dream totally. sequence. Totally. It's literally, it, you are in 2046, he's in the future and they're making him think. Right. Yeah, who knows? Well, you know what? Well, before Amy gets back, we're going to jump forward and get into some of this CW invasion madness. That's right. There was the all four shows crossed over with each other, rallying against an alien threat, calling themselves the Dominators. Let's talk about each episode and how they related and which ones we felt really kind of worked the best. We had Supergirl, The Flash, Arrow and Legends of Tomorrow, all of them crossing over every night, each one airing, starting with Supergirl. I'll start off by saying... I thought the the four way crossover is really kind of a three way crossover with a little edge of a little taste for Supergirl because you know let's face it that Supergirl was not about the Dominators or anything else it was no. Cadmus it was Cyborg Superman it was Martian Man it was, it was a really fun and cool episode if you were watching the season two of Supergirl you're in for a treat it's I think every episode has been really fun um, it's definitely light hearted but it's it's a it's a fun show so that they were they kind of barely tied in with the Flash showing up at the very end. Um, I thought it really, I thought it worked really great. Let's backtrack for a second. Amy Dallin has shown up and she has actually seen these two trailers. I'm Let's hear really it. Really sorry, I was Guardians. running late. Oh, what I'm so think? happy. Oh, it needs 100% more Gamora. Other than that, perfect. Yes. Everything about it is perfect. Except it needs more Gamora. But what do you think about? I the assume there'll be more Gamora in the movie. There's like two hours of movie. That's what was a great way to introduce yeah. her. Yeah. It's very interesting watching them slot all the cosmic stuff into their comedy framework, but like it works. It works. It's so much fun. Totally. And you don't still don't know what the movie's about. Yeah. So, all right. Well, what about Legion? Looks good. I like I I want it to be good. I want cool, sophisticated X-Men stuff. I know it won't really be connected to anything, but like X-Men's all about alternate universes. This is one of them and I can't wait. Hey, look, I mean, it's Noah Hawley. If you haven't seen Fargo, well, you're talking about Fargo and season one and two, the TV series, not the Coen Brothers movie, but the Fargo television series is without a doubt my favorite show when it's on. It is a mini movie every single episode. It is fantastically made. And the second season is truly even better than the first. And the first season is incredible. I cannot tell you more, like highest regards check out the Fargo TV series if you haven't seen it. It's fantastic. The letting that, the world be real, like his socks sticking out of the machine in that teaser, like it's such a cool moment of just like, this is a look at a, a real person living in this heightened reality. And what do you think, do you think, what year do you think that's taking place? Because I was telling Robert, I think it actually is taking place in the eight, early 80s. It's so hard to tell from the pieces we saw in there. It's, it's like secretary, it's like no time. But just uh, the, all the clothing styles, everything about it is like not now. So Seems I, likely. Maybe there I are flashbacks? The, I maybe have, the whole thing's happening I feel in the like past? the whole thing is happening in the past. I watched it like three times looking at I was like, there's nothing technologically advanced past like the 80s. So. But you know, I'm curious about, since we're talking about Legion still, the, I finally caught up with Mr. Robot. Mm -hmm. I had not seen Mr. Robot, and I sat down and binged watch it. What, I loved it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was incredible. A um, lot of twists and turns. Oh, yeah. Things I had guessed, you know, it was... Some of the things were not hard to guess, but sure. but I, I've been reading a lot about uh, its depiction of mental illness mm -hmm. and uh, how it's done a great job of dissociate, dissociative disorders, that kind of thing. And I'm curious, uh, will Legion do the same? Like, are they going to try and do a realistic look at his mental illness if he has a mental illness? Um, I'm very curious because I thought that was probably one of the most interesting aspects of Mr. Robot is... Right. Hit the main character's state of mind. Sure, sure. Yeah, without without going into into any spoiler territory, right. that's another show that you should be watching. It's a lot of should be watching going on. Mr. Robot, check it out. It's pretty fantastic. I still like Fargo a little bit more. I do but too. Mr. Robot is fantastic television. But the, both both main characters, both Legion and and um, our character and Mr. Robot, uh, 
have, are suffer from severe mental yes. distress. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to be curious to see how they handle that. Yeah, like what's real, what's not real. Right. It'll, yeah, we don't know with Legion right now. So definitely check it out. It's, it's uh, premiering in February. So let's move back into the CW invasion. So we're just starting to talk about the crossovers. We just started talking about Supergirl. So I said I actually enjoyed the episode of Supergirl, but it really works if you're actually watching the season of Supergirl. It doesn't. It has really almost zero to do with Dominators or crossovers or nothing. It's just Flash shows up at the end. What were your thoughts about the Supergirl episode? I mean, it was really fun to watch. We, we talked a little bit last week. I, I was prepared because of our show last week where it was like, all right, it's not really going to be part of the crossover. Right. And that made it easy to right. just enjoy as an episode of television. I don't know. Did you all see this thread that was going around this weekend that was uh, about Supergirl that w- will make everyone cry immediately? No. Uh, there's a woman on Twitter named Safi Geek who sells comic books uh, in Indiana. And she, like, you just go look up the story because I can't do justice to it here. Uh, but certain big emotional moments in the Supergirl episode uh, this week uh, are playing on a storyline that is meaning a whole lot to a whole lot of people. Uh, and she, she works at a store in Indiana, and uh, a young woman came into that store looking for some comics and then kind of started having an emotional reaction as soon as this retailer was sort of like, oh, Supergirl, I love that. I'm totally shipping Sanders. Uh, sorry, Maggie Sawyer and, and, and Alex Danvers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the girl kind of broke down, and they had a huge conversation. And it's a look at what, like, the reason that we say representation matters, and the story will just destroy you. So go look it up. Uh, you'll cry and be really, really glad that this particular nerd worked in this particular store and was there on that day when that girl needed her to be. That's great. Uh, and it's, I, it's an incredible Yeah, and I think like, what they're doing with Supergirl and the storylines and representation is fantastic, and it's being done really well. And it's it, it, uh, kudos to, to the people who are in charge of Supergirl. I think they're doing a fantastic job, and it's a really fun show. Um, your thoughts on Supergirl? I, I, no, I agree, and I, I think she's great as a lead. I mean, she's really appealing, and she was great in the, the whole crossover, I thought. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But I really like, I like the tone it might have my favorite tone of all of these shows mm-hmm. because I think that the whole Invasion crossover showed the wildly divergent tones of these programs. Most definitely. And how it, it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't work. I agree. You know what? The soap opera-esque elements of all four of these series that are, you know, superhero shows, but they really, you know, borrow quite a lot from soap operas. Um Supergirl works, at least to me, the best because it's the least milk toasty and, right. you know, kind of like, hey, we're CW, bah, 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 like my relationships and stuff like that. If this feels like it's like, hey, if they're going to talk about relationships, they're going to do it in a, quite a, a, uh, an emotionally realistic way, as, as emotionally realistic as Supergirl or, you know, the, you know, Arrow or The Flash can get. I think they deliver. Let's move on to The Flash episode. Now, I particularly, out of all four of these episodes i found as far as for the crossover invasion aspect to it i really enjoyed this one probably the most because it just had the most team building and the most of everyone meeting each other and getting to know what what the problem is who are these dominators so it really felt like it was like the the closest you're going to get to like if you were able to make a three and a half hour you know crossover that one should have been you know hour one and then the other two should have followed suit with that as opposed to like zinging or binging some of their other characters that weren't introduced in The Flash. What are your thoughts, Amy? Oh, it was fantastic. It, it, it absolutely was. This was chapter one. Supergirl was chapter zero or prologue or right. like that, that all the, the virtues and failures of this crossover were comic book virtues and failures. And even that makes me happy. Like, so even I, I know this sounds weird, but like that there was sort of a meaningless tie-in portion that makes it even more of a comic book crossover. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> like, You're absolutely that, right. That, you, that they tricked us into buying a zero issue that was only tangentially related. Like that's what you do. Yes. Uh, but like the, I mean, reviewing what happened in one hour of TV time on the Flash, they pack so, so much. much in. Yeah. It, it happens to be like my. It's it's kind of at war with Supergirl now, but in general, it's my favorite of the shows. Mm-hmm. It like. It hurts me inside that Cisco's sad, but that's my only note. Yes. Like, and it's, it's supposed to hurt me. It's supposed to kill me that, like, that, that dude, like, yeah. takes was, so long He was to... the fun one. He was the one with the zingers and the jokes, and now he's bumming out because his bro is gone. But Flashpoint. Like, all the, the, the introduction of Supergirl and getting everybody to meet each other, the, like, little, the, 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 
what do you call it? The beginning and ending, book ending structure thing with him sure. and Arrow behind the wall. Like as it, it was just a, a completely successful hour of wonderful, entertaining Super Two Hotel. And where did they find a place that looked exactly like the Super Friends How Hall long of has Justice? He that? Yeah, the like, Hall of Justice. Come on. Who's paying the electric bill on that thing? Why are there so many American flags in that building? I don't know. <laughs> Robert, it's what do you think about The Flash? Well, you know, here's... I have mixed feelings about the whole crossover. And I thought... Because here's the thing. I I thought the Dominators were underserved. And I didn't get, like... They were not too much of a threat to me. No, no, no one seemed really that... It, no one really cared that the Dominators were... Like, eh, a few government agents and our teams. They cared about the Dominators being there. But the whole rest of the show was all of our characters, like I love the Flash dealing with the fallout of Flashpoint. Sure. You know, what Cisco was dealing with, and that Victor Garber was dealing with the fact that, oh, now suddenly this daughter, you know, the, what, what I'm dealing with now. The whole, the whole crossover, and then Arrow as well, right. I know we haven't got to Arrow sure. yet, but it was all about this alternate look at his, what his life could have been, right. you know? And, and I thought that was all the interesting character stuff that we wanted to see anyway. Right. Like, it was almost like they needed an excuse to put all of these, let's all be reflexive about our lives. Let's, we're all going to go on a sort of a, on a Christmas carol thing. We're going to look at the ghost of Christmas past, the yeah. ghost of Christmas. It was all like that with all the characters for the entire crossover. And I thought the Dominators were underserved. It wasn't yeah. like when the Borg showed up in Star Trek The Next Generation where yes. it was all about the Borg. The Borg were scary. The Dominators were not. The, the Dominators, Dominators were not. They didn't really have much of a plan. They were like, like oh, metahumans. They were, were crybabying about the Flash did this. It was uh, almost like the day the Earth stood still without any of the threat. Right. And, and that's, like, come on, man. I mean, I, you know, the Dominators in the DC universe, I love the invasion crossover. Sure. I love aliens that attack the Earth. And I wanted more of that. The well, Dominators, look, the Scions, man. They had, like, take out some civilians, cause some carnage, see that something. those sort of I mean, stakes, it's, it's like, like they didn't seem too interested in the rest of the planet. It, when they like were just one kind rock of, quarry. They were kind of walking around the city where I was like, yeah, and then Supergirl and the Flash kind of tagging them all with those little nanobites. And it was sort of like, and, and then you had like uh, just human characters like kicking their ass when they did that kind of Civil War run at each other thing. It was like, so these Dominators aren't really dominating anything. They no. can barely fight a human. <laughs> Let alone, you know, they, they just kind of sucked. But they I think they worked as far as just to get everyone together. Look, we got to fight these dumb, like, corny aliens. But let's have a really cool story. The Arrow story was like another, the for the man who has everything, That's, Superman annual. Uh, it was literally like a reflection of that. And you know what? For someone like me who doesn't watch Arrow... It was kind of like, I don't know who that character is, and I don't know what, oh my God, that's his dad, and he got killed in like the first season, and he's back. How was so, it for you to like to watch that one? Was, Are uh, we on Arrow now? How was it for you to watch, like, I've seen the first three seasons, right. so for me, it was absolutely perfect, because I think that is designed to take a person like me, who's seen the first three seasons, but hasn't been keeping up, and be like, man, I miss this show. Like, yeah. and on that level, it worked perfectly. For me, who has not watched it, um, I think I've seen like two episodes, and I don't even know what season it was, but... For me, I actually kind of liked it because it was an introduction to all these characters who are both living and dead, how they react to this fake dream world as they figure it out, and little flashes of their past, like when they what's that? Uh, you're Black Canary, all these kind of weird flashes. So for me, it was like, oh, I wonder what season that was. It was kind of intriguing and almost has me wanting to watch Arrow. Not yet. <laughs> But Those I new almost, kids were fun because that was my introduction to them because I, I I like I Mr. Yeah. Terrific and Mad Dog and Rag Ragman. <laughs> come on! I'm like, yo, is Ragman in Arrow? Because now I gotta go back and watch this. <laughs> that is crazy. That Ragman is actually a real thing. Robert, no, what I, are your thoughts about? I, but I Arrow? loved all that. I mean, I, you know, I'm not up on my Arrow either, but I got it. I mean, you get it. The, for the man who look. Look, we've read so many comic books in our lives that I could jump in in any show, any time, and be like, oh, I get it, I get it, I understand. But the man who, who has everything, that, that storyline is so classic. It's so, we all get it. Right. And they've, it's like every TV show does an alternate history story. You know, Next Generation did it with Tapestry. Picard, you know, he doesn't get stabbed by a Nausic and he doesn't have an artificial heart put in. He's just a lowly lieutenant, you know? It's, we've seen that in every genre show. They, had, yep. they have to do that. But it was good, I mean, I liked it. I will say though that the crossover did have maybe my favorite line of, I think Supergirl said it, when she said, you guys can be Earth's mightiest heroes. <laughs> I died, I almost uh, did right. a spit take. I was like, 
That was awesome. Yeah. I was like, wow. There were a lot of little fun nods yeah, here and there. She's my, looks like my cousin. All those kinds of things. Yep. So Legends of Tomorrow kind of wrapped it up. And I thought it did a good job as far as wrapping it up. Like I, like I said, I think the Flash and Arrow were the strongest of the, right. you know, the four. We're not even really going to call Supergirl like, part of the crossover. Legends yet. also had, next to the Flash, it had the most actual crossover, like, story-moving content. Yes. Like, yeah. Arrow was an, ish, was an episode of Arrow that was tied in. Supergirl was an episode of Supergirl that was tied in. Flash and Legends is where the story really happened. Totally. And Legends also had the going back in time. I mean... I mean, the Flash and Legends of Tomorrow are just going to have to figure out their time jumping. They're, bu- they're like, well, you went forward and changed the time. I know, but I didn't do this. Then I went forward and corrected it. But then when you corrected it, you did- they've got some stuff. The writers have got to sit down and have a, a summit meeting <laughs> for your next season. You've got to figure this out because it's well, getting confusing. But- and, you know, they shoot in Vancouver. Yeah, they're all together. So, so, but it's like no, but it's like they need to have a writers they had, crossover. They had lo- they had X Files locations, right. like the big that big like mill, that huge yeah, mill, totally. you know, where where we we the mountain Cheyenne Mountain or whatever. No, it wasn't Cheyenne Mountain, but where, where all the DNA is kept mm-hmm. in the X Files. And then they basically had the cigarette smoking man as a young man and an old man in the in the crossover. And I'm right. like, why didn't they just bring Fox Mulder in, or why didn't they just bring in? The cigarette smoking man and have him play himself. But isn't the ending especially like like I felt like I was watching some nineteen sixties show like and we're gonna station you in Antarctica. That's yeah. like that's like out of like nobody. Oh that come on, that was anymore. adorable. Supergirl totally got that dude demoted. I know, I know, but that's what I'm saying. It's got that little campy aspect to it, which is like it is forgivable, but it's like at the same time. It was wanna... an interesting way to play like the big alien invasion story was to like play into the X Files version of that the like secret right. like throwback to '50s stuff as long as you're having it. Oh, in I mean, it like, was cool so. I mean, those locations they had to know. Like, <laughs> yeah, okay, this is the X Files, the right. mill where Mulder sees the ship rise up. I mean, I, I was like, okay, but that's cool. But I, I really did enjoy the melancholy nature of of the post Flashpoint. I mean, the Flash is kind of messed up. Yep. You know, he's. What's happened and what what how people's lives have changed and what could have been and what is now and I really liked all of that but I think I I think that that the tone of that show all of those shows is so bright and buoyant for mm-hmm. the most part even Arrow that they should have gone more melancholy all the way through mm. Ooh, you know but that takes so much of the fun out of like here's Supergirl everybody be sad for a week uh, no I don't mean, I don't mean to be sad but I liked seeing these characters grappling with the fact that their lives were maybe not where they're supposed to be and like in a christmas carol at the end you can bring it back yeah. but right. they did that they like victor garber you know he was pretty he was pretty bummed yeah with martin stein and cisco were sort of the like the the ones you emotionally hooked into during this event as they both and i like that they with grappled with it and came up with the right conclusions you right know? Which i mean was really cool we know cisco's got a ways to go to forgive barry but i, I liked that uh, martin stein is like no i want to have i want to keep my daughter yes i want to it this was, timeline to survive. I'm really curious to see how they'll do, like, because the, the Cisco Berry friendship gets a really important moment during Legends of Tomorrow. Right. Um, I'm curious if they'll just sort of revisit it for folks who might have skipped it, like, in the following week's episode. I but, hope not. But, like, they, <laughs> I, I, I thought it was pretty beautiful the way they played. Like, yeah, Cisco really should have seen that coming when he's like, time travel, yeah. And it's like, you probably don't feel like that. But I get it. But the way right. they played his revelation was really sweet. I'm right. sorry. I'm really into Cisco. No, no. I mean, <laughs> we all think Cisco's a great character. So it's it definitely, it'll be fun to see how, like, this crossover, what happens next year when they do another crossover. Because I think this was a su- successful event. All right. It was, I think so, too. Ultimately, I, I enjoyed the heck out of it all. So if they do do it next year, what do you want to see happen? I would like to see uh, not an alien threat. In the least, you know, I think it would be it would be better and I think well served if it was uh, emotionally connective, like if it was some some kind of thing that they all have to grapple with, but isn't like a threat from beyond or so, you know, it's I don't know what it is because I'm not writing this story, but I could suggest maybe some kind of governmental threat or maybe even like a, you know, a no masks clause or like pick a, you know, pick a like something out of the Watchmen or something, something that they all have to deal with together. So I don't know. What do you think? Uh, the crime syndicate. Ooh, you know what? Jason Inman said the crime syndicate yesterday. And oh. I was like, wow, the crime syndicate would be fantastic. Because it's another Earth. Right. You know, it plays into the multidimensional aspects of it and make the crime syndicate bigger. So there's counterparts, you know, that they can, there's new characters that we haven't seen yet because there is no. Has Green Lantern been introduced? There no, hasn't been. Not yet. 
you know, so power ring. You've got I love that idea. What do you think? I, that's syndicate? a fantastic idea. Yeah. I, part of it, be, part of the fun of this one is that you get a little bit of mind control, so you get hero on hero action. Right. So the only ways to do that are like doubles or like somebody going rogue. Um, so either they have to take down one of their own, or or you need like doppelgangers. And uh, we'll be far enough yeah. away from Flash season two at that point that it won't have been like, oh, we just saw all this. Or you could I do lo- a John a pocket universe thing. You know, like don't do Zod, Ursa, and Nan, but do some kind of a. They all get shifted into into a pocket universe, and have they have to make some really big choices that will haunt them later. See, Although a threat pocket- from Supergirl's world coming into the rest of the Arrowverse would be a really interesting. That's one. good too. Yeah, like merging the Earths or some kind of weird. Yeah, some kind mer- of like crisis meltdown where there's only one Earth. There's like 38 Earths right now. I know right. we're dealing with so. L Corp right now. I, they'll probably just be this year's story, but like something like that where they're like, oh, there's another universe. Like, I love let's the crime go. city. I think the crime city is yeah. a great, a great idea. I love them. I've loved them since I was a little kid. Well, let's move on. You know what's uh, really fun? Spider Man has got some wings, yo, and also Thor is wearing his helmet. That's right. A sneak preview clip for Spider Man Home coming screened at an event in Brazil called the CCXP. The clip followed Peter Parker speaking with Happy Hogan about Tony Stark leaving him a special upgrade. Then we see Spider-Man leaping off a building and revealing his webbed wings that he's had since the very first appearance was drawn by him from from Steve Ditko. He's had these weird wings. Maybe they're going to be a little bit uh, more useful and he's going to be able to kind of float glide or something while he's fighting the vulture. Who knows? All You know, also in Brazil, we saw the first promotional image from Thor Ragnarok of both Thor and the Hulk, both in battle armor, ready to fight. So Hulk is totally planet hulked out, wearing his armor, and Thor is finally wearing his helmet, but brandishing swords instead of meow meow. So what could this possibly mean? Uh, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna start it off going with Thor. We'll work our way backwards. He doesn't, he's got two swords. You know what we know, we've, I've been tricked before with promotional art from the first Thor where he's got his helmet on and then the whole movie, the very first scene you see of Thor is he's taking his helmet off and he never wears it again. So I don't know if he's gonna wear that helmet. All of us super comic nerds want him to wear the helmet, at least in battle, come on. But it's probably not gonna happen. Um, but he's, he's got swords. Now why would he not have Millionaire? Mil, how do you say it? Milner. <laughs> Milner. Um, I was going to say meow meow, but uh, I said it already. But I think Beta Ray Bill has got the, the, the hammer. That's my guess. I'm, I'm going to say it right now. Beta Ray Bill beats Thor on this Planet Hulk universe, gets the hammer, and takes off. It's either that or, or Hell has got it, but I'd much rather have it be Beta Ray Bill. What are your thoughts on that image, Robert? Well, first of all, I was calculating how much that Hulk hot toy is going to be. Mm. With the with the exterior armor, it's right. got to be five hundred bucks Damn. and plus. But whatever, uh, I loved seeing the Hulk in that armor. I mean, that's that's amazing, and I, I think that we've we've been talking about Beta Ray Bill being on it being in the movie for a long time. Sure, we've pretty much doubled down on the fact yeah. that yes, I think this image sort of proves it because where else would the hammer be? Right. I mean, we know who's we know who's calling the shots up in right. that ivory tower across the street down over there. That's right. Come on, we know. But I, I I'm excited. I mean, I think it really shows that this is a way different movie than we've seen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe before. Totally. I mean, the idea that that Hulk and and Thor are fighting side by side like this. I mean, I can't wait. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. Amy, what are your thoughts? I was going with the very boring, he has been separated from his hammer for plot reasons and must face this challenge without it, but Beta Ray Bill's way better, so I hope it's that. Right. Right. But you're probably right. (laughs) It's probably like, you you will regain the hammer of Miljolnor, or Miljolnor, however you say it. (laughs) Meow, meow. After you've done, yeah, you will get meow, meow back after you defeat this demon, Surtor. You know, whatever. But they can't. It, look, they're going. They're, they're playing the Planet Hulk storyline. It's I not know. like it's not like anybody who loves Thor doesn't think about Beta Ray Bill, right? If you're going to an alien planet, there's all kinds of crazy aliens. The planet's called Ragnarok, and there's going to be gladiatorial fighting, right? What would be the first thing you would think of if you were Kevin Feige? Beta Ray Bill. That's right. All right, the <laughs> Lord and Savior has spoken. Let's move on. We've got minor mutations. Let's start off with the minor mutations. We're going to list off a bunch of these. Uh, Smaller stories and talk about them. Number one, we've got more set picks dropping on set of the Defenders. That's right, they're shooting the Defenders right now. Same time as shooting the Punisher. Number two, we've got alternate costume tests for Jared Leto's Joker. That's right. Those are also a lot of 
uh, scenes that would have been cut out and maybe like one minute of that would have been shown in the movie. Number three, we've got non-curvy Spider-Man homecoming logo appears. That's right, a, a straight, flat kind of Spider-Man who are people who are just not into that curved Spider-Man logo now have a flat one to look at. Number four, we've got Michael Bay would do a superhero film. It would have to be his way or the highway because he's Michael Bay. <laughs> Um, or the Bay Way. Yeah, it's the Bay Way or the Highway. I like that even better. Um, number five, I'd like to look at that image for a while, is a Hulk and Hulk Buster fight in a great fan made short. Now, check it out. Just go on YouTube, type in fan made Hulk and Hulk Buster, and watch this pretty crazy, amazing fight scene that goes on for quite a while. Where, and it's really well done. The animation is really well done. So, hats off to uh, the group of people who put this together. I think it's really fun. Number six, finally, we've got Luke Cage gets the order for season two. That's right, we're gonna get a little more Sweet Christmas coming to us. What did anything pop off to you guys, Robert? Well, look, I love, I love Luke Cage. You know, I love Coulter, he's great. He's my man, my new man crush, you know. It was John Barrowman at first, now it's Coulter. Right. But I- You're I, I mean, your heart for both. I, you know, I, there, there really is. Uh, people are now going to be like, "What's he saying?" Um, but I think that that uh, that Luke Cage was a great show that has a lot of places it can go. Like it's and it's, I like that it was much more down to earth, sort so to speak. I mean, all the shows in the Hell's Kitchen Netflix universe are down to earth, right? But this was more down to earth, and I'm I'm curious to see where they're going to take a season two. I mean, I guess it'll be post Defenders, so we're gonna. It, it, all of that is it's going to be all up for grabs i mean going and seeing that they're shooting defenders and shooting punisher it's it's like do they just do they have the same crew shooting this stuff i mean what's going on well, you are set yeah they share some of the crew i mean especially not you know the people shooting but the, all the behind the scenes people are making uh making things for everybody so it's a, it's a it's a big group effort that's going on in the Netflix universe, and I think it's really fantastic. I would love to see you know more crossover between all of those characters. I know right. we're going to have the Defenders. They're going to have standalone season three of Daredevil, season two of Luke Cage and Jessica Jones. But I'd like to see those other characters kind of fit in a little bit more so in the the further adventures of the Netflix characters. How about you? I'm Fox really on? looking forward to that, just because. The relationships between some of these characters are the things that I love most about them. And while I love the idea that everybody gets to sort of stand on their own for their debut, like, assuming that, like, I hope I love Iron Fist, but I will always love him best when he's with Luke Cage. I need to see those guys hanging out. Totally. Uh, right. I, so that that's that kind of, like, it doesn't need to be everybody as a full player in every, like, it's not infinite seasons of the same mass show, right. but, like, I'm really looking forward to watching that go forward. Um, and, man, I don't like the Spider-Man logo, and I think I like it better flat than curved, but I still just not super into it. Yeah, the Spider-Man logo is just, it's there. I'm just, I'm more into the Spider-Man movie, so yeah. I'm hoping... I'm hoping that is the thing that's great and not, right. the, you know, you know, none of the logos have really, really ever grabbed me. So no. for any of the Marvel movies to be blunt, it's like, you know, I think they got the Doctor Strange. They got the right kind of curvy. Uh, you I know. think the Netflix logos have been great. Yes. For me. Yeah, they're mo they're more comic booky. Yes. You know, and they, they, they're more dynamic. They're bigger. The so. Daredevil logo is like pretty much right out of the comic and as it should be, it's awesome. So <laughs> um, let's move on to our flashback of the week and it is Batman Mask of the Phantasm. That's right, this movie came out in 1993. When you think of Batman films released in the theaters, lots of people don't bring this one up, maybe because it's animated or just they never saw it. Well, let's set the record straight. This film is incredible and it tells one of the best Batman stories ever to make it on screen. Uh, it was originally going to be set to direct video, but it ended up being released in theaters, told with framing devices very similar to Citizen Kane. We learn about Bruce Wayne's lost love, Andrea, and how both of their lives took painful turns when they left their love for each other. Did I mention this has some of the best scenes in any Batman movie, and it's also got the Joker? Let's talk about Mask of the Phantasm. Robert. Well, I think this, like you just said, I think this film's incredible. I, I, it, it's very adult. It's very serious. It has an incredible score from Shirley Walker. Oh, totally. The music score is incredible. And, you know, I, it's too bad this isn't a live action movie. Not that there's anything wrong with, with animation because the, my only criticism of this movie, and it really isn't a criticism, is that the, the animation is not as lush as we're used to. 
it's still you're still dealing with basically what looks like the television animation from the Batman the animated right. even series. though they upped the budget for this they did. it still is not enough yeah I mean it, it, if it had the kind of lush animation it would have been an A-list I mean this film could have made 200 million dollars yeah, but it, it's it's still it's a great like you said it's a great film a terrific Batman story the villain is all of it's very very interesting and um, I can't recommend it highly enough I think it's great how about you Amy I love this movie I I should watch it with a more critical eye for the animation I I, I think I always love just it looked like I wanted it to look because right. it looked like the show uh, but like I think it's a serious contender for one best Batman movie ever made I, it I I. That you put it on the list, and I was like, God, I need to rewatch this because it has been a while. But like, I love the bad guy. Mm -hmm. I love the mystery. Yep. I love the character dynamics, and like, I love that it's animated because just that's what we want is to spend more time in that Timverse and have a really serious, wonderful story told in that way. And that's what we get with Mask of the Phantasm. And if you haven't seen it, you're missing out. Yeah, this, this is directed by Bruce Tim and Eric Radomski. Uh, it's written by a whole slew of amazing uh, writers. Paul Dini, a whole bunch of different people contributed to it. Uh, Burchett, a whole bunch of people. What are, I think it was sort of the birth of also the direct-to-video DC movies. I mean, I think this it was, was going to be direct video. They released it in theaters, but it was the birth. You're absolutely right. Right, and it was it was everything kind of followed this, and and this level of quality uh, really boded boded well or bode well for the the future of that series. You know, I just realized I don't own this movie on Blu-ray. Is it on Blu-ray? Yes. Okay, I've got to get this. Yeah. I, I was just I've got the DVD, but I never thought about getting the Blu-ray. I, I I must get it. Let me. I'll have to triple check. I know I own it, but maybe it's not on Blu-ray because I bought it a while back. But the Blu-ray's been around for so long that I feel like I have it on Blu-ray. Right. I was but I could I, be wrong. It's an, it's an emotional Blu-ray. It's an emotional. You remember yes. it in perfect crisp detail. But yeah, it's a beautiful film. Definitely. Um, I want to bring up a, a little a cause that I think is great. Uh, Dwayne McDuffie, uh, the award for diversity. Um, I wanted to draw attention to a great award set up for the late writer producer Dwayne McDuffie, who produced and wrote on Justice League Anime Unlimited, Ben 10, Teen Titans, and was also the co-founder of Milestone Comics, an African-American comic company that published Icon, Hardware, and Static, among some of the other characters. If you'd like to enter for your nomination, please go to the link that's in our credits. If so, like right outside of the YouTube link, check it out. You can click on it. If you're an up-and-coming artist or a writer, uh, please check it out and uh, enter yourself to be part of this Dwayne McDuffie Award. I think it's great, and it's going to let him live on forever. Um, let's move on to our Twitter questions. Number one, we've got Goku Black asks, who would you say is DC's most complicated villain? Two-Face, Superboy Prime, come to mind for me. Boy, DC's most complicated villain. Can't be Doctor Doom, because that's Marvel. Um, <laughs> I would... I would want to say it's, you know, it, it depends on which era you're in because Lex Luthor for me was very complicated in the newer reboot of Superman in the late eighties, early nineties right. when he was a businessman and not a cackling scient, you know, I'm a mad scientist guy. I like the businessman who was jealous of Superman because he could never be Superman. So I, I like that take. How about you, Amy? Well, I was leaning towards Lex, but I, I also, the, the question asker mentions Two-Face and I really like, the, the Gotham Central version of Two-Face, mm. uh, I'm really, really fond of as just something that feels like the Batman villains specialize in in their, like, they, they really excel in the area of, like, you can apply psychologically realistic looks at them and they right. don't lose any of their, you know, there's some things where you're like, don't think through why the alien wants to conquer the planet. <laughs> but, like, certain ones you're like, no, they really benefit from this, like, more sophisticated take. Batman villains really are great there. And I'd say, yeah, Gotham Central Two-Face for me. Yeah, the duality of Two-Face and, and Harvey Dent is a very strong. How about you, Ryan? See, I, I have to go back to the new Teen Titans villains, first and foremost be, being Deathstroke, mm. because, you know, Deathstroke is set up to be such a bad dude, and you really hate him, what he does to the, the Titans, especially with Terra's introduction and what happens with that. Oh, yeah. But then he becomes really nuanced, like he ends up being their friend kind of later, and there's a lot... You know, there's a lot going on. He's much more of a, of a 40s film noir superhero villain, if that makes any sense. Totally. And I really like that. I mean, I did like Luthor. I love that, that one of the early issues when Byrne took over after Crisis, when, when uh, Luthor, his computer, figures out <laughs> exactly right. who Superman is. It's Superman's Clark Kent. Luthor's like, 
No, he's not. If you were Superman, why would you be a mild-mannered yeah. reporter? Dismantle a, this computer and a, fire everyone. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I was that, was like, that was great. One of the one of the better better issues in the burn run. It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. I yeah. love that burn run. Uh, uh, have you Brent, seen? Oh. I, I I wish. If anyone can get me the name, uh, have y'all seen that wonderful piece of fan art that was going around that's Lois Lane just sitting there tagging like yes. things on Facebook? Yes. Um, and it's a picture of Superman carrying her, and it goes, do you want to tag Clark Kent? And she's just like... Yes. That's... It's, it's yeah. a perfect image. I, I Please look it up. I wish I could remember who the artist was. Oh, yeah. Was, no, it's, it's, I but, saw it on Twitter. So I was like... Uh, uh, next question. Uh, Brent Bolin asks, does Fox have to make a Fantastic Four movie to keep the Fantastic Four movie rights? Could they just keep the rights with a Silver Surfer movie? Well, Brent, no, that's not how it works. Uh, they have to be in development, i.e. writing a screenplay uh, in another year or they lose the rights. If they haven't actually gone into production by, tw I think it's 2022. I mean, it's, the rights issues are very weird, but they have to they have to hit these certain benchmarks in order to hold on to those rights. Now they didn't do it with Daredevil, and they didn't do it with Ghost Rider. They just let those rights lapse, and we see what's going on with that. Um, that's as far as I understand it, Robert. Any, anything else? Yeah, I mean, that's you can't make a movie. The Fantastic Four presents the yeah. Silver Surfer and Galactus. You can't do that. No. I mean, you you you've bought the rights to the Fantastic Four. You have to make. A Fantastic Four film, although that's it's sort of an interesting, you know. Why don't you do like we're gonna make a Mole Man movie? Right. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a nihilist you know. featuring one of the Fantastic right. Four. I am right. Curious, like how how do they structure those deals? Well, like, it, I mean, you don't lose the rights to Surfer if he's not in a, the movie, do you? Do, yes, like, they lose the rights to everything. But, but they technically, they they're still using minor mutants who never appeared in an X Men film, and they have the rights to those because they bought like mutants, right? Right. So when you buy FF Universe, how much do you get with that? Do you lose the scrolls if you've never used them? Because the whole point is that they like Mar regular Marvel can't use scrolls because they're mm. part of FF, but they haven't. Like I, I don't. How do these? It's things a very work? good and annoying question because <laughs> it's like it's who knows, but that seems to be like what you're saying is right though. I, Let's I'm, make a Power Pack movie because Franklin right. Richards is in Power Pack and that's he's true. reading Well, Sue's you son. can use Power Pack, but you can't have him. Right. right. Next question is the sweaty nerd asks, could the Aquaman movie open the doors to a Namor movie? Well, sweaty, uh, let me tell you, if Aquaman is a big hit, you can bet your bottom dollar that you're going to be seeing Namor, the Submariner, flying around with little fish ankles, little you know wings on his fish ankles. You're going to be seeing that. What do you think, Robert? Oh, I, I think that there's probably already have been plans afoot to make a mm. Namor movie. Oh, yeah. I mean, Who I think owns one of Namor? the. Well, that's a good question. Who owns Namor? Well, he, he would be he, that I believe is Universal Paramount. There's like it's a double double whammy. It's what? like yeah, Marvel doesn't own it. Oh, Marvel. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I think that both Aquaman and a Namor movie are 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 both fighting against Entourage, the TV <laughs> series Entourage, that's because right. Aquaman was such a joke for a long time, and then. Then it was a real and James movie. Cameron and made James it Cameron really made awesome. It. I, yeah, and it was just how do you get around that? Well, you know what? If Aquaman it is a, it, if James Wan does that kind of magic on Aquaman and makes it awesome, I guarantee you'll be well, someone you, is going to be. You know what? That just that anymore. one shot. If one shot can sell you on a movie, it's that one shot in the Justice League trailer where he's standing there and the waves are crashing. Totally. Over. I'm like I I don't know what that shot is from, but <laughs> I'm like that shot alone makes me want to see. An Aquaman. Totally. Movie. That's so it. So here's a weird thing. I think the invention of airplanes made humans in general stop respecting the ocean enough. Like, I think Aquaman is a joke because most people don't deal with boats right. and the ocean on a daily basis. The, the ocean's kind of a big deal and has been a huge force in mythology and human storytelling for a long time because oh, yeah. it's crazy powerful and dangerous and big. And, like, maybe we're all going to remember that with the Aquaman movie or maybe you're all going to laugh at me. But, like, it's no one it's is kind of be, a big deal. No, due to climate change, no one's going to be laughing as we yeah. lose all of our shore property. But it's also 75% of the globe. Don't forget, that's what water is. And the levels of acid that rise in the ocean and as their massive fish die outs and we start starving to death as a, as a species species because we've polluted our oceans well hopefully aquaman will help fix it in the movie world so our sweaty question of the week it He'll comes come from i am gonna i just looked it up uh because i felt bad for calling out an artist and not knowing their name max carpston did that wonderful lewis, nice. lewis lane uh, superman illustration which you, you should look up check it out
Now, our last question, the sweaty question of the week is Meteor. Simple question for you guys. Do you prefer to have Beta Ray Bill in Ragnarok or Warlock in Infinity War? Well, I'm going to start off by saying, hells yes, Beta Ray Bill in Ragnarok, a dream can come true. And then we could have Thor and Beta Ray Bill in Infinity War, or it could just be Beta Ray Bill in Infinity War, and Thor will have to go find, he'll be in the next one. Who knows? What do you think? Warlock or Beta Ray Bill? Why would you make me choose between you these You must things? choose. I think I'm going to go Warlock. There's a lot of time to bring Beta Ray Bill into future, like, I hope we'll keep making Thor movies of some kind or other. Uh, and I do want to see Beta Ray Bill, but, like, it would be awfully nice to have Autumn Warlock around for some infinity shenanigans. Sure. Just seems right. Robert? Well, I mean... You know, he's asking like an either or question, like we'll get one or not the other. Like yes. somebody's going to make you that choice. You must choose. Yes. All right, look. I love – Adam Warlock is a, is a cosmic character, and I love my – and actually so is Beta Ray Bill. But uh, I like I like Adam Warlock. I've always liked Warlock. I, 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 I probably would rather see him because I like his costume better because no. Beta Ray Bill is just wearing a variation on a theme, whereas not Warlock totally. – hot toy. I want a hot toy for Warlock. <laughs> if I got one of the toys, I would pick Beta Ray Bill. Horse and Thor costume, into it. Yeah, yeah. but that's... Okay. It's the Walt Simonson Kirby, uh, Kirby'd Thor I version, know, which is I, so awesome. I know. Well, that's it for uh, our episode 86. Where can people find you online, Robert? Uh, you can find me... This is a very loose episode. It was, show. wasn't it? Was it was pretty good. I like <laughs> it's it. It's crazy. Uh, you can find me at uh, Burnett RM on Twitter or RM Burnett on Instagram or at Robert Meyer Burnett on Facebook. And Amy Dallin, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me at Enthusi Amy. I'm sorry for coming in and chaotic. Don't worry about it. <laughs> then, uh, but chaotic what, uh, good, Amy. Yeah. Chaotic yeah, good. Chaotic yeah. good. Enthusi Amy online. You can find me everywhere. Thanks for watching. And I'm chaotic neutral at uh, just at John Schnepp, just on Twitter and Instagram. You've been watching Heroes, episode 86. Don't forget to pre order that Slayer comic January 24th. See you next week. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.